Welcome to the first episode of season one of A Story Club, Global Cultures. We are so pleased to have you here. This is a unique venture that is being streamed live every week from three locations around the world. Dehradun in India, San Francisco in the US, and Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. Uh, today, our topic is global diasporas, and we are joined by some very eminent and knowledgeable guests. Professor Robin Cohen from the University of Oxford, who's the author of Global Diasporas, an introduction. Welcome, Robin. Thanks very much, Kirk. And, and you're joining us from where? Uh, I'm, I'm in Oxford, yes, in, at my home in Oxford. <laughs> right. Very nice to be with you and nice to connect to Trinidad, which is a place I know well, having worked there in between 1977 and 79. Excellent. And we also have Professor Stephen Taylor from the American University, author of Exiles, Entrepreneurs and Educators, African Americans in Ghana. Welcome, Professor Taylor. Thank you very much. Right. And where are you joining us from? I'm in Washington, D.C. All right, your nation's capital. All right, excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, greetings from uh, sunny, tropical Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, now, since this is on the story, a story club network, I want to start off our discussion on global diasporas with a story of why this topic of diaspora is of interest and importance to us in Trinidad and Tobago, especially at this time. Right, so before 1498, the island was known as Irie, and there were a number of indigenous Amerindian tribes, um, population probably around 40,000, at least 14 different ethnic groups. It was a very vibrant place. And when Columbus came, that changed history, of course. Uh, you had the Spanish, uh, coming in, uh, the depopulation of the indigenous populations. You have the Africans coming in. Then you later had the French, the Portuguese, Chinese, Indians, West Indians uh, from the other islands, Syrian Lebanese. So we have this hodgepodge of people, this great mixture in this tiny little place here. And links were kept with our ancestral identities. We were a colony as well, so we always had the link with Britain. But not only with Britain did we have our links, but we had people like Eugene Chen, who, in, who was an important part of the um, Chinese nationalist um, revolution uh, in the 1920s. Uh, we had Henry Sylvester Williams, uh, who organized the first Pan-Africanist conference in the world. Uh, George Padmore, who was very important in the African liberation struggle and in Ghana in particular. C.L.R. James as well. Eric Williams, uh, V.S. Naipaul. So we've always had uh, these connections uh, with our larger identities. But as we gained independence in 1962, there was not really a consensus with the whole thing. And there was a question of whether national identity even existed at all, and what to make of our ancestral identities. And, and now just last week, elections were called while this series was already planned and, and in train. But that que the question of elections adds more relevance to our topic of diaspora, because it always brings up questions about nationalism, loyalties, economic, political, social, and religious differences between groups. Uh, and all these questions are heightened, especially at election time. But at the same time, as we have these ancestral identities, Trinidad and Tobago has created a sufficiently strong identity that we actually have a diaspora of our own in the UK, in the US, in uh, Canada. And so the question of diaspora is, uh, works on both ends actually for us. So that's interesting. Now, I believe that by discussing this issue in a larger context with gentlemen of your stature, your experience, your expertise, it can help us here in Trinidad and Tobago and for listeners around the world to think about diaspora in a global perspective so that we can put our debates in a larger context and work out our issues productively. 
So I hope that has some resonance with you as guests. And uh, I'd like you to share your stories. Before you take off on any of the points I raised, I, I want to hear you speak about your stories. In particular, you know, how you became aware of diaspora issues, how these issues have been important in your life, either personally or in terms of your research, and what you've learned by your research and study of the issue. Um, I will invite Professor Cohen and then Professor uh, Taylor afterward. So, uh, Professor Cohen. Okay, great. Thank you, Kirk. That's very interesting, your narration about um, Trinidad. I was born, curiously, in South Africa. My mother was Polish, my father Lithuanian. Both were refugees or exiles, so already for me, there was a sort of echo of something strange and some, something different. But I identified strongly with South Africa, even though um, politically it was getting worse and worse as apartheid dug in. So I left in 64 at the height of the apartheid regime, went to Britain and met up, teamed up, in fact, with a whole lot of Ghanaians and Nigerians, and that perhaps connects to Steve Taylor's experience, um, who were then emerging from colonial oppression into nationhood. And that was an interesting experience in itself. And in fact, I did my doctorate on Nigeria. So, and lived there for two years. So I've been something of a rolling stone right from the beginning, uh, having had that uh, parental uh, connection with um, Lithuania and Poland, born in South Africa, out to London, back to Nigeria, another African experience, and then in fact to um, Trinidad and uh, various other places. So for me, biographically, the process of moving was very much what introduced me to migration. I wouldn't say it introduced me to diaspora until it became a little clearer that the migration studies that I was familiar with in the 1970s and 1980s were running out of steam. We needed some way of connecting transversal movement, circular movement, complex movement, hybridity, uh, creolization. We needed to, in other words, understand what was behind migration and understand it not simply as a group from A going to country B. So it was a much more complex, circular, transversal movement. And at that moment, uh, in the 1980s, early 90s, um, there was a sort of revival of the concept of diaspora. And I grabbed onto that and said, yeah, that looks like it might work. It's an ancient word. It was you know, a Greek word initially, closely associated with uh, Jewish, Armenian and other experiences. But will it work to capture this new and complex form of migration that we are now observing in the 1980s and 1990s? Sorry. Right. Good. Thanks for that. Uh, Professor Taylor, how about yourself in terms of diaspora in, in your biography and your research? Okay. Well, personally speaking, I mean, I, I'm a diasporic African for many, many generations. I'm a descendant of slaves. Or, um, my great great grandparents were slaves. And I, um, so, we're, of course, obviously, by you know, visually, you can tell that I'm of African descent. But um, I, I, I began to develop more interest in the idea of repatriation to Africa, probably in the 1980s. And um, I was I had, uh, um, had finished undergraduate school, and I saw that there was uh, an increase in racial tension. We during the 1980s we saw um, elections that brought in people who were. Uh, uh, more hostile toward the advancement of African Americans winning elections in the United States and um, <clears throat> people who had opposed the civil rights measures back in the 60s were their careers were revived during the 80s and I so I, and I, it made me start considering the idea of um, is that a viable option because I had known about um, repatriates to West Africa and I started I developed an interest then. I never was able to act on the interest until 
um, years later, after I um, yeah, started a career in higher ed as an academic advisor, then later on went back to school and um, got the master's, another master's and the doctor's in political science. And then it was during that time, even though I focused on U.S. politics, looking at politics of race and ethnicity, I did do some studying on the idea of um, uh, looking at West African politics and the idea of people who had repatriated to Af West African all the way back to the beginnings when um, African Americans went to Liberia and to Sierra Leone. Um, and then I, it was in the 90s, in the late 90s, after I came here to American University as a professor when I started doing research in Ghana, because that seemed to be the primary target of um, repatriation was Ghana. Probably one reason because it was English speaking, and that's one reason why I decided that I would do my research there, because I didn't have to um, deal with a language that I wasn't too familiar with. So I did some research there. I, I made a number of trips to Ghana, um, either um, either there doing research or at conferences presenting research. Then I spent a more extended period of time four years ago on a Fulbright um, fellowship from the State Department. And I went to, um, and I taught at the University of Ghana. And during that time, when I, that semester when I was teaching there, I also did research. I um, interviewed a number of African-American repatriates and um, became involved in the organization that represents them, became very active during the short time I was there. And um, through the interviews, I was able to um, put together my, my book, Exiles, Entrepreneurs, and Educators. And you know, so I was, and what I found was looking at some of the older literature about, um, I was able to compare those repatriates who came during the 1960s, late 1950s, with a, a new wave of repatriates who started coming in the 1980s and looking at how different they were. And then looking at um, what, what, um, where I fit in with, with this, with repatriates. Um, and is that a viable option for African-Americans? That's something that I've looked at and still consider, I still pay a lot of attention to today. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. I have a, a sort of repatriation story of my own in that I, I grew up in Canada, actually, and all my family from Trinidad had migrated up there. And um, I, had, I, I, I had a sort of epiphany, I suppose. Malcolm X was very much part of that. I, I became very uh, much seeped in, in the whole tradition of black nationalism and, and the ideology of it in the critique. And, and I really couldn't stay <laughs> and live up there. And I decided I wanted to leave. Um, and but then I was I was wondering should I go to Trinidad or should I go to India <laughs> and I had and I had to think to myself about that and um, you know my family's been six generations in Trinidad I have no family that I know of in India it's it's, a, it's almost a theoretical question about India where it's, it's a real thing in in Trinidad and of course I ended up in in Trinidad and, and so forth but um but but we have these uh um, you know, the, the idea of, of loyalty, uh, repatriation of, 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 of what your links are to, the, to, the, to your land of birth or where you've been for multiple generations, even though your ancestry may, may be elsewhere. Um, you know, these, these questions we devil societies like ours. Um, and I, I suppose now more and more and more countries around the world. Um, what insights from your own research uh, and experience uh, would you uh, have to share with us on that question of nationalism, loyalty, plural societies, relationships with indigenous people, all these mixed up questions that we have to deal with all the time. Uh, Professor Taylor, uh, let me invite you first to answer. Well, I can relate to you talking about six generations on um, in this hemisphere, and certainly that's uh, to the point where there are no contacts with um, with your ancestral homeland, and that's the that's the situation for the vast, vast, vast majority of African Americans, including myself, such a family. There is um, there uh, um, so that see so there is yeah, but the difference is is that um, you know you living in Canada can relate to Trinidad as a homeland. Um, living in the United States, there is no homeland to relate to um, for, and for myself and most African Americans, except for those from the Caribbean diaspora, which I'm not a part of. 
uh, to have come from Jamaica, Barbados, uh, Grenada, uh, Antigua, Trinidad. But so, so that, um, so, and that, that's an issue. I think so, a lot of African Americans have felt like um, there are so many obstacles to prof personal and professional and psychological advancement here in the United States looked at uh, we're looking at is that is that a viable option going to Africa where there are no ties where you don't have um, where you don't have family members that we know of so that was that 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 was a concern and I think that's probably why the numbers aren't large of repatriates going back to Africa the, the numbers are large and then I think uh, and, and, and the other issue is that <clears throat> the fact that no, we do not have citizenship there in any of the countries there. So then there, those are obstacles of being a non-citizen in a country where, uh, in, you know, like most countries, where many of the benefits are, are reserved for citizens. So those are challenges that people face, and people have to consider, are the challenges to life in the United States and the issues that brought about this Black Lives Matter movement, are those challenges and those issues, are, are, are they... Uh, are, are they more of an obstacle to, to growth and advancement than the obstacles of non-citizenship in a country where, um, where, the, where the majority of people, including the leadership structure, looks like you? You know, I'm curious, as you know, an African-American who's been to Ghana several times, um, what, uh, you know, because I, I know, you know, the experience of, of Indians uh, from Trinidad, who have gone back to India or connected with Indians in the UK or Canada or elsewhere. And there's not been often a, a, a warm embrace, <laughs> if you want to put it that way, sometimes. It, it, it's, uh, it's not always been like that. What, what's your experience been um, in, in, in interacting with Ghanaians and West Africans in general or Africans? Well, uh, it, um, I agree. There has not been that warm embrace. Um, <laughs> Because whereas coming from here, where African Americans are probably 12% at most of the population, and when it comes to power structure, probably less than 1%, you know, we're very conscious of being black, of being of African descent. That's something that we think about not just every day, but every hour, if not every minute. And uh, it, it affects so much of us. So to go to a country where people don't think of that, um, they're not necessarily going to embrace us because we're black. Because black is not a novelty for them. Yeah. It's not. It's. It's not even something that a lot of people put um, emphasize um, because it's not. It, 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 they never saw that to, as an obstacle to the degree that we have seen it here. So that. Um, so, so that's that's certainly you know there's certainly not that warm embrace and then that and uh, people who are alive now don't remember um, colonialism. So there isn't, that, um, th there isn't that feeling of being downtrodden by Europeans. And so, that, uh, so those, those are issues that people have to consider that going back there, you know, while you might not face, you certainly won't face the level of discrimination here, you're not going to find, probably it's very unlikely to find police officers kneeling on your neck until you stop breathing. You know, we'll find that there, but it's not going to be the idea of welcome home. We've been waiting for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Cohen, um, uh, yeah, about the, the same question about, you know, nationalism, plural societies, dealing with, you know, sometimes indigenous populations with, uh, you know, other immigrants, all, all, all these questions. How, you know, you've researched so many uh, di diaspora communities as well. I'd love to hear your insights. Well, there's so much I could say on this, and it's difficult to contain everything I would want to say in a coherent answer. But let me put it like this, that I think in a number of cases, and you two have both illustrated this, there is a problematic question of home. You're not quite sure where it is because you may have been cut off from home, either through multi-generational effects um, or through the initial trauma of displacement, where, in fact, that was such a, a violent um, encounter, 
slavery in the case of Africans, the, you know, the dragging off of uh, the Jewish um, leadership and many of the elites to Babylon in the case of Jews, the, the, the famine in the case of the Irish people, the genocidal attempts against the Armenians. So in that process of violent displacement, the meaning of home is often very problematic. So in a way, one could say a lot of what we're talking about is the search for home or imagining home mm. or creating home or recreating home. So there's a very, very complex engagement with the idea of home. It's not that simple um, where home is. Yeah. You know, and I, I could obviously do that autobiographically as well. Um, in my case, my father came from Lithuania as a young man. I went back to his village only a few, uh, two years ago, in fact. It was a wretched, miserable place. Um, my aunt, my grandmother, and goodness knows what else, being Jewish, were caught up in the Holocaust. And so the idea of going home to this little village in Lithuania was just absolutely out of the question. I'm glad I went, but if only to say, hey, that's not it. That's definitely not where home <laughs> is. You know? And of course, I had a, a very strong connection with um, South Africa where I was born. And if I were to say truly where is home, I would say, probably I would have to say South Africa, although I've spent many years now in Britain and regard it as a second home, perhaps, um, which I'm very fond of, and people I've been very well treated here, and I love um, all sorts of people here and the institutions, but I would not say it has quite the emotional, gut-wrenching uh, reach that uh, South Africa has for me. Mm -hmm. And just out of curiosity, where in South Africa was that? Was that Cape that Town? Was in no, in Johannesburg, yes. Yeah. So, uh, rather underrated place. People always rather shriek with horror, but it's absolutely a lovely place. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> my, my wife is from Mauritius, and, and they have a lot of links with uh, South Africa. And yes, right. Nice. right. I have many friends in there as well. You know, so you know, let me um, put this question to both of you. Um, you get this a lot in, in Trinidad, and, and our Trinidadian audience uh, might be thinking this. Why do you hold on to your ancestral and identities at all? Yeah. We're Trini. Just leave that aside. Um, all, that's just causing problems and division. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, I'll start with you this time, Presta Cohen. Okay, now that's a, a very legitimate question. It is a legitimate question. And in a sense, one, what one is looking for is a warm, encompassing, multicultural, pluralistic, um, democratic environment, which you feel comfortable in. And of course, if that existed, um, the search for home that I alluded to, that desperation to try and look back to prior identities would indeed disappear or at least be severely, um, you know, compromised. But it's partly because of what one has or what one finds in your place of settlement or in your place of residence, which is some, somewhat unsatisfactory, doesn't answer all the questions of who am I, where am I from, what does that mean to me, to my ancestors, to my children, that one reaches for these wider identities or these prior identities? And the whole question then arises, and of course you've alluded to it by using the word loyalty, whether you can have these multiple identities and still uh, as it were, not be accused of dual loyalty or of expressing identities that are hostile to the place that you now find yourself in. Right. Um, there's. I, I want to just follow up quickly with you. I know you have spoken about the differences between the idea of a diaspora and merely a migrant community. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate on that for us? 
Well, okay. So, you know, we, we all know the history of this has been that it was used rather narrowly and exclusively for four or five groups until the 1980s. And sudden, suddenly there was an explosion of consciousness where everybody found in the word diaspora, where a lot of people did, a lot of groups, oh, yeah, that's it. I, I feel part of this diaspora, of this wider thing. And they fixed onto it. And to a degree, that a movement to claim a diaspora diasporic identity kind of got out of hand with all sorts of rather implausible claimants, um, you know, and we won't go through all the, the weirder ones, but uh, one did have for professional identities, uh, you know, even uh, wrestlers declared themselves to be a diaspora and so on. And, and so I think what one, one, one needs to um, see here is that there are some minimal criteria one of which is a sense of group identity or group solidarity. There is some kind of sense of group coherence. Secondly, there's some kind of recognition of a common history, maybe a traumatic history, but essentially that's now gone out of the board and people are saying, well, it doesn't, there are all sorts of other historical identities that we'd like to claim or be part of, which are not necessarily the violent victim identities of the past. And then I think there must be also a sense of connection to that home. And finally, some sense of commonality with other people in other situations, in other places, that you feel some degree of commonality with. So a degree of co-solidarity with other people of a similar ethnic or religious background. So if you have those elements, they can be fairly loose and you don't have to be put everybody into a straitjacket and say, unless you have those, you're not a diaspora. But I think you need some sort of minimal criteria in order to be able to use that term productively and creatively. So finally on this issue, what, what would you say are the um, biggest diasporas uh, in the world? <laughs> well, if, if, I mean, if Jewish, one, African, right? Th those are two. Definitely. Well, uh, no, the Jewish one in numerical terms is very small, but right, of course yes. it, it, it's very potent because it carries a lot of the echoes of the diasporic concept and the diasporic experience. And it's a group whose identities uh, who, who identity has survived for a long time. So it is a very powerful experience. In one, but I think the biggest numerically is the Chinese identity followed by the, the Chinese diaspora followed by the Indian identity uh, or Indian in the diaspora. But I mean, I hesitated using the word diaspora because for a long while, the Chinese scholars refused to accept it. Wang Gangwu, who's the great historian of Chinese abroad, refused the term of diaspora, mm. as did a number of Indian scholars. But now, in a sense, the great wash of diaspora has gone over the Chinese and over the Indians. And so now it's widely used and widely accepted um, that the Indians and Chinese are the both diaspora, have diasporas, and that they are the two largest, biggest uh, diasporas. Yeah. Okay, interesting. All right, so Professor Taylor, yes, this question about, you know, why hold on to these ancestral identities and so forth? Well, what's your uh, response? Well, I think um, one is that, that um, the United States has been described as um, so, um, the hackneyed term is melting pot. People can come to the United States and somewhat um, surrender some of their identity and adopt this, um, this identity that we call ourselves American, which you know, is, is um, kind of hegemonistic as a term because, uh, because America includes Two, two separate continents on the on, on, in an entire hemisphere, but we try, tend to think America only includes 50 states in the United States. So I don't. Uh, so, but we, we, you know, there's um, there's this feeling that um, we can adapt, adapt um, assimilate, melt into this, and maybe leave, uh, bring in some of our culture and and, and create a bit of out of what is American. But there have been some groups that are unassimilable. Now, um, you know, the United States has had, um, well, certainly they've had, I guess you could say, four big waves of immigration. First was the settlement, um, um, you know, in what is now the United States. By, and then it wasn't called the United States. These were British colonies. People from England came and settled there. That was a form of immigration. 
and settlement. And then after the United States was established, you had a wave of immigration that happened in the early 1840s, mainly from Northern Europe and Western Europe. Um, Germany, you had a lot of people came, particularly that was accelerated in 1848 after the failed agrarian revolution there. And a lot of Germans, um, some settled in urban areas, uh, um, some came earlier than 1848, and some settled in the Midwest and, um, <clears throat> and the, the, the farming areas. Uh, likewise, people from Scandinavia were part of that area. A lot of them settled in the Midwest. A lot of them got involved in, in farming and contributed to the progressive politics in two Midwestern states, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Then, of course, during this time, you also had the Irish immigrants. They had a more difficult time assimilating, possibly partly because they came extremely impoverished with nothing. Whatever, whatever they had, they spent to come on um, to come to the United States for passage uh, to the United States. And they're then people were afraid of them because of a religious difference. But what I'm saying is that, so that was that second wave that came in the early um, to mid 1800s. But by the end of the uh, 19th century, the, 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 the people from that, the, that second wave and the first wave never had to assimilate because they established the, what was um, the nation the, the called the United States. But the second wave had assimilated pretty much. And then you had a third wave that started coming in the 1890s and those were immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and they, they faced a lot of discrimination and they, um, people, who, a lot of people were um, religiously discriminated against because they were Jewish and the lingering anti-Catholic discrimination um, they, they faced. But see, by the time that World War II ended, those groups had assimilated and they were no longer thought of primarily as being Italian or Jewish or Greek or Polish, but they were, before that, they were thought of as being white. But one group has been there longer than anybody else. And most African-Americans came, their, our families came before the 19th century because after um, the early part of the 19th century, the constitution and um, banned the importation of slaves, but they didn't need to import them because so many people had been imported prior to that for, for two centuries prior to that. So they, they came, they adopted um, the religion, the Protestant religion at that, which was the dominant religion, they adopted the English language. And still, they're still, they're, um, they've been unassimilable, as I said a moment ago. They have never been accepted to be assimilated. They, you know, even after emancipation, um, they still, there you know, were black codes followed by very strict Jim Crow laws. And to the point that um, even now people when, um, the, the first thing people think when they see me, the first thing is if they don't know me, oh, black man. That's the first thing that comes to that mind. Um, not an American, not a fellow American, a black man. So, so it, it might have been our desire to assimilate, to be a part of this country, to be a part of that melting pot. But, uh, but we, you know, it's not a part of the, uh, the majority of the United States to bring us in to that same level that other um, um, people from the earlier waves of immigrants have um, come in. And we're not a wave of immigrants. We're just, um, we, we didn't come voluntarily, but we've been here a long time. The only group of people that can claim such a large percentage of people who've been in, uh, in, in this country for longer are Native Americans. That's right. You know, I mean, that, that raises so many uh, important issues. Uh, one is, you know, the, the different, you know, when people speak of minorities, there's different types. There's, you know, minorities, mm -hmm are indigenous, some who are recent arrivals, some who've been there from before the nation state was even founded, and you know, some who are foundational people, and, and to treat them all in the same way, with the same laws, and with the, and, uh, and pro, it, it's, it's um, you know, that, that, that's a failing, it's an intellectual failing, it's a historical ideational failing, and, um, and I, you know, there, there's a, another way I would like to think about the, uh, the idea of Unassimilable. How would we say it? Unassimilization. I don't know. <laughs> but 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 uh, uh, unassimilability, perhaps. But not being able to be assimilated into this melting pot. Yeah, I think perhaps that, and and, and I'm following here from um, Sydney Mintz and um, uh, what's this? That 1972 author, and he writes on the the Maroons in Suriname. Oh, I can't remember his name, but but he and Sidney Mintz wrote an excellent uh, book in '72 about the Afro-American nation, uh, and and of course the communists had this before. Of course, um, other people, the Nation of Islam, is in many ways uh, connected to the idea. Uh, 
but that African Americans created a nation, their own nation, uh, at the same time as white America or you know, connected to obviously in a subordinate colonial relationship mm -hmm. to um, to Euro America. But, you know, I it struck me in, in a very real way when I was visiting some family in Minnesota. Right. So, you know, everybody has that Minnesota accent, basically, if they're Chinese immigrants, if they're, you know, uh, been there a long time since the 19th century, you know, of Norwegian and Scandinavian heritage or whatever, you know, and then but when the American, Black Americans, you know, like on the bus, I was on a bus, and they're talking, they have, there is an Afro-American accent, and, you know, and I know it goes back to the South, and, and even when Afri African Americans from the North talk about going home, you know, many times they refer to, you know, Alabama or Mississippi or wherever, um, their family would have come from during the dispersal, especially in the 1930s and whatnot. Um, that, yeah, that, that uh, you know, the, do you agree with this whole idea of the American nation? I'm sure you know uh, about the whole history uh, of that notion. I'd like to hear your v uh, thoughts on that. Well, I, I, it, it is my contention that we as Black Americans have created our own culture. Yeah. You know, there are, there, there are certainly some connections between the cultures, the various cultures in West Africa, but we've created our own cultures. As I said a minute ago, we adopted Protestantism and Christianity, but because we were forbidden from worshiping with white people, we adopted our own denominations, our own styles of worship, which, are, which brought in some Africanisms, yes, but it's still, we, um, we, it's, it's still ours. So yep. we, we have a we have a culture that we created not intentionally, but circumstances forced us, and so so therefore you have um, you, uh, you you might see people speaking certain dialects uh, a certain dialect regardless of where they are you see some relevance and it's um, and it's similar um, to some people like for instance uh, you know um, a lot of people who are Jewish older Jewish people might live in Florida. Still, you might find you might hear a little bit of Brooklyn, a little bit of Manhattan, and they're speaking because they grew up at a time when assimilation was not an option for them. So, and, and it functions as a nation language. Don't would mm -hmm. you agree or, or not? Uh, yeah, I would say a nation dialect. Yeah, more, right, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, but the, the fact is, a lot of uh, what a lot of people aren't aware of. Is that we have de we had developed those uh, in some parts of the eastern coast we developed our own language it's called Gullah, which mm -hmm. is some African languages and um, and people you saw it spoken in the Sea Islands off of South Carolina and Georgia small parts of North North Carolina and that and strangely enough that language was brought to Africa um, people are not aware of this group first of all a lot of them were um, involved in Revolutionary War the British. Um, offered them emancipation if they would fight for the British, which some of them did, and then the British lost, and they uh, and and they so the British offered them land in Canada. Some of them went to Canada, but they found that they, they, you know these were agrarian people, and it was difficult. The soil and the climate was not the type of agriculture that they were used to. They couldn't continue, so the British allowed them to go to West Africa to establish a British colony, which became Sierra Leone. There's a language spoken there called Creole, K R I O. And it's and it's Gullah, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't realize that they're speaking a language that was brought from South Carolina, or or, or as those of us with South Carolina origins would call it South Kakalaki, <laughs> and that in, um, in 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 West Africa, and they just say it's Creole, not realizing that. Um, so you know, so you see that you know, so we do have we have established our own culture, our own language, our our our, our, own, our styles of music, styles of. Uh, family rearing styles of worship. So yes, it is, and that that are unique. That is, is relevant to some of the uh, West Africa, somewhat relevant to the United States, somewhat relevant to Britain. But it's still it's an amalgamation, as all cultures are. You know, right. are forced into just developing culture. We've developed a culture that I think that I'm proud of, and I think we have a lot of reason to be proud of. Yeah, yeah, I I agree totally. I I think of it in similar uh, in. Trinidadian Indian culture as well because you know people say oh well this culture is not Indian and and yes mm -hmm. that's true but we have created 
an Indian culture here, an Indic culture here that, that that's mm-hmm. part of the family, uh, you know, and and I think that would be you know similar for many communities around the world. But it's just that people don't think of it in that way. That you know, culture is constantly being created everywhere in the homeland, in in the out in the outlying places as well, and and it's always interpenetrated as well. I mean, there, there's never anything pure anywhere in any case. Yeah, so so that's really fascinating. Um, well, there's some that I want to bring up. When I was doing my research, some people were critical of the African Americans in Ghana. They say, you know, they, you know, they, say that they um they said that they're trying, they're damaging the cultural integrity. They're uh, challenging the culture and changing the culture there. They that they at least they were accused of that. And I said my argument is that culture is not static; it is dynamic. All cultures are in constantly changing. No culture stays the same over the, over centuries or even over decades. So if there's a change in culture, that's nothing new. Right, right. Here, here's one thing I would like to um, ask you um, both about as well. Economic development and dias- mm. diasporic links. Um, for instance, I know in Asia, Chinese populations abroad, very important in um in helping develop china as well um it you know it's been said i don't know how true it is but that for instance even singapore uh played a a strong a strong role in in with uh deng xiaoping and uh, Mm -hmm. in consultation or or at least um looking at the example of lee kuan yu in singapore and and uh, i'm thinking about opening up china as well um but but certainly remittances and and channeling Mm -hmm. of of investments and, and those things um, so, so there's that aspect of, of a link with the homeland, but then also there are the questions of, of the populations in their new homelands having dif- differential economic experiences, some being poorer, some being richer, you know, minority groups being seen as exploitative and that these then say for in Trinidad, um, you know, the differential experiences feed into the political competition and, and whatnot. Um, from your research around the world and personal experience, et cetera, I'd really like to hear what, what insights you have to bring to it. Professor Cohen? Okay, great, thank you. And let me just, um, before I get on to your direct question, concur very much with the spirit of the last conversation, which is to say, when we talk about diaspora, you mustn't imagine some historically fixed cultural um, Uh, um, matrix that is unchanging. And indeed, what one is really looking at is a complex of changing cultures um, as people interact, not only between the minority and the dominant culture, but between minority and minority cultures, so that you get a very complex idea. And some idea, some people say this is a concept of creolization actually helps to understand that and I think you said your wife is from Mauritius and that's a very good case in in point of a a creole island but let me try and address more directly your question and that is to say the role of diasporas in homeland development now let me start by saying of course the originating country is very keen on promoting this idea that their, in inverted commas, diaspora contribute to the homeland. And there's some irony in this, of course, because both in the case of India and in the case of China, which you alluded to, um, the leading elites up to the 1960s or 70s were simply dismissive of their Chinese population or their Indian de- de population abroad. They regard, regarded them as a part of a historical anomaly, in a sense, part of a historical shame that they became indentured laborers, many of them. And they, it is only a much more recent phenomenon that these governments and these countries are beginning to cultivate their diasporas, obviously for instrumental purposes, because often you're talking about collectively a very, very powerful um, remittance flow. And we know that uh, the remittance flows exceeded the amount of foreign aid about 15 years ago and is now competitive to all um, financial uh, direct investment. So 
remittance income is a very, very important part of economic development uh, in the countries of origin. And so it's quite common for countries to sort of capture or seek to capture um, their home, their their diasporic populations abroad. In the case of India, Indira Gandhi suddenly talked in terms of, you know, Mother India reaching out towards its daughters and so on and so on. That was not what, <laughs> not what Nehru said uh, in 1947. Yeah. So, well, I, I just want to uh, just briefly interject here. It, uh, looking at this sort of um, dual role the Caribbean has in diaspora, being, uh, you know, di a diasporic population, like kind of a child and a mother, because remittances to the Caribbean are now the number one source of foreign exchange for mm, many, exactly, many islands. Exactly, exactly. Yes, no, that doesn't surprise me. And of course, it's something to look at right now. We, we, we live in, in the midst of this awful COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we've already began to get some of the data back on what this looks like in terms of remittance flows. And they've collapsed by about 20% worldwide, 23% in the case of South Asia. So this is a bit of a crisis. Oh, of course, it's a crisis for all of us in so many ways, we don't really want to go into that. But in terms of the direct question that you ask in, um, the, the interruption in the flow of remittances is going to create all kinds Kinds of interruptions towards the development uh, projects um, in uh, some of the major countries of the global south. So a very important thing to us to think about. Right. Professor Taylor? Well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, as far as now from the perspective of African Americans, there is very minimal remittance to our yeah. land because we don't have the ties. But, you know, the African diaspora that lives in the United States, many people do depend our remittances back to Ghana, back to Nigeria, back to Cameroon, back to Sierra Leone, back to Liberia. So that's uh, uh, so they're, they're very dependent, but even more so dependent is the Caribbean, particularly the poorest um, country in the Caribbean, which is Haiti. And that, um, that's, that's how Haitians survive because the soil has been depleted, so they don't have agriculture. Um, the, the, the wages are very low and the lowest um, one can imagine. So people are dependent upon remittances from Canada, from France, and from the United States, particularly from the United States. And I know when I lived in Boston for a number of years, you had, you'd see these offices called Hatrex Co. offices. Of, and I lived in a heavily Haitian community, a Haitian Transfer Express company. And people would line up to send money back home. And it was expected. Then when we talk about culture a few minutes ago, that is part of the culture of diasporic people is that secure, you are expected to send money back to relatives or sometimes to friends that's expected. And if you're not a diasporic person from these countries and you marry somebody there, you, you know, you're going to have to go along with that program if you want that marriage to survive because you have to, you, you have to realize that your spouse is going to have to send money back to family members who would not otherwise survive. So that, you know, that's, that's certainly something there. Now, as far as when we talk about the African-American diaspora going, um, sending money back to Africa, a large number of the African-American diaspora that I, population that has moved uh, the repatriates are women who are married to African men who decided to come back um, and, and establish economic enterprises back home. So therefore, in that case, it's not necessarily so much the sending of money, but the, help, help the economic development and they've, and, and they've been welcome to come back and help develop the country, um, particularly um, that um, in the 80s when Ghana um, uh, strongly embraced free market eco economics, that's when um, that, that was the desire for them to come back and invest in the economy. Um, and, and of course, a lot of people came back, were people who, had, who were diasporic, who had gone to the United States. Now they're coming back because it's a little bit easier to establish businesses there. And quite often they're bringing their spouse, spouses who are um, descendants of slaves like I am. Right, right. Now, I, I guess to, to relate um, these questions, because there, there's so many things we can talk about, but, but if I try to ground it on, on some of the issues that, that come out of the Trinidad experience, especially now with the elections and so forth, the, the question of, of living together um, uh, is, is important. Uh, so... Uh, you know, and there, there are kind of two models, you know, one is, as we talked about, 
you know, forget your, uh, forget your ancestral identities and we assimilate and we're all just Trinidadian and, and uh, you know, we, we all bring something to the table. Eric Williams, our first prime minister, had a very famous phrase. There's no mother Africa, no mother India, no mother China, no mother Europe. There's just mother Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's another... Um, us, uh, you know, the thing about, you know, this, a mosaic culture, you know, where, where we are, where all our um, ancestral identities make up this complex whole that, that are who we are. But, you, but, we ha- but then we have the questions about the differential experiences of, of the group, especially in terms of economic power, political power. Um, you know, and, and this is not so much about recent migrants who may be sending remittances, but, you know, um, communities that have been there for generations and, and you have these um, problems. What sort of um, insights uh, do you have from your own experiences and research on these types of questions, um, Professor Taylor? Well, um, I think when you're looking at um, people who've been in this country for generations and generations, multitude of generations, meaning uh, people like my family, and what is our commitment to Africa? I think one thing that you notice, um, and uh, Professor Cohen, you might be very, I'm sure very well aware of this, the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. Because the United States was one of the biggest um, benefactors towards South Africa. You know, as far as you know, a lot of U.S. businesses being there, and so in, in that anti-apartheid movement included many Black Americans who, prior to that, didn't have strong ties to Africa as far as familial ties, but because they they they, they could see the parallels between what we went through and were con- continually going through in this country and the apartheid in South Africa, and we were very instrumental um, getting getting institutions to divest. Get um, colleges to divest, getting businesses to divest, getting the government finally to pass sanctions over President Reagan's veto, um, getting um, uh, and getting um, sanctions and and helping bring down apartheid. I'm not saying that we it would uh, that, that we did it ourselves. Of course not, but we played our role and and we're proud to many um, African Americans politicians here in Washington came to Washington stood in front of the South African embassy and got arrested, developed police records, had their fingerprints done. Now they, there's a record on them. And they, they uh, and some people, um, you know, spoke out again, uh, um, spoke out and worked at institutions that didn't like them speaking out. And some of them, including myself, lost their jobs as a result of that. So, you know, so we, we saw the connection. And, um, and so it, that, that was a contribution that I can say that we made. I don't say that we made a strong contribution to the independence movements in Africa that we saw in the 50s as we did, but not to the degree that we saw in the anti-apartheid. Right, right. And, and about the, the place of African-Americans in United States society today, right? Um, you, we have the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, exploding since the uh, death of George Floyd and, and then mm-hmm igniting all over the world as well um and and but but in terms of what it means for america i i haven't i didn't check into the story but but somebody sent me something and said you know um there is a black militia or a black group i'm not sure that's asking for the state of texas and uh and reparations and and whatnot and this obviously is is the old question of 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 how you know, how do the groups live together or apart? Or, you know, is, is, the, is the ultimate goal assimilation and that this is just some sort of historical process that we're going through and eventually we'll all mix up and become this one homogenous identity? That's a model people have in their mind that I don't think has happened mm. Well, maybe it has happened in certain places. If you say the Gauls and the Franks and whatever don't mm. exist anymore in France, or you know the Angles and the Saxons, I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, well, how, how do you see, um, you know, the uh, yeah? How, how do you see this playing out in in, in the states in these persistent questions? You know, what Gunnar Myrdal mm. called the American dilemma and W.D. Boys, you know, from 1900 or 1901, I, I believe, in, in his um, work. Uh, how, how do you see these, you know, um, 
how, how, how do you see this working out in, in going forward? Is it going to be a persistent problem or what? Well, anybody who thinks it, whose ultimate goal is assimilation, that's a very elusive goal, which I, um, I, 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 is something that we're never going to realize in our lifetime and in the lifetime of our children, our children's children. I just, I hate to say that, but that's, um, that's you know, it's obvious because that goal is not, um, has not been reached. And it's not going to be reached anytime soon. And people who believe that at some point we're all going to be one, um, you know, that, I believe that's just about as much of a myth as the Easter Bunny is. You know, it's just, I, unfortunately, I just don't see that happening. I think all societies have fragmentation. Fragmentation exists in all societies. And, um, and what easier way to fragment people than on, on the basis of, um, the, of their physical appearance? And all societies have cleavage structures. That's just, um, and, and, and it's not just in this country, but certainly in Africa, where you have these, this, forced, uh, this forced cohabitation as a result of the conference in Berlin uh, um, in 1884, 1885, where they drew up these boundaries and said, you're one state and you have to exist. And, these, and they created these multi-ethnic states without the consent of the people. And they're still, they're still dealing with that and still struggling with that, trying to, trying to form a national identity. And, and I, don't, I don't see it happening in this country, not in terms of African-Americans, maybe other immigrant groups that are coming eventually. But, um, with, um, but I think there's, there's still going to be that fragmentation. And Professor Cohen. Well, I, I, this is a very good question, and I very, very much appreciated um, Professor Taylor's answer. But let me think of it, or let's think of it in terms of a Venn diagram. You know this idea of an overlapping circles that touch each other and overlap from time to time. Now, if we see that as a dynamic and moving set of circles that are sometimes touching, sometimes overlapping, I think that probably represents reality better than inv evocations of melting pot or assimilation or whatever it is. It is basically a much more complex and dynamic process. I'm a little, perhaps a little bit more optimistic uh, than Professor Taylor in this sense, that I think many people have developed what could be called a repertoire of trying to move between these different circles and within that shared space as it overlaps. And in other words, young people in particular are quite smart. In a particular setting, they can change their accent, them, mm -hmm. their manner, their dress, the way they connect with each other and so on. And they're able to so somehow or another um, move away from those rigid boundary lines. And I suppose that may be the best we can hope from. Not that all those circles will come together and create one uniform identity, but somehow or another, there'll be smart people, often young people, who have developed a repertoire to move between those circles with a degree of agility that perhaps some of us older folk don't necessarily have. Right, right. Well, yeah, that takes us into the question of creolization and, and all <laughs> sorts of things. But, you know, we've, I, I see I've taken you a bit, we've reached the, the one hour mark, taken you a bit past. I've, I've kept you guys uh, for a long time, but I want to thank you so much for this very insightful and thought provoking conversation. But before we go, I want to ask each of you whether you know, you're working on anything right now that you'd like to let our audience know about, do you have anything you'd like to plug or promote, uh, please let, let us know. Professor Taylor? Well, um, right now I'm in the early stages of doing some research on, uh, on democracy in the United States and how uh, uh, African-Americans have not benefited as much. Primarily I'm looking at um, how black are, are, are um, their votes in presidential elections count far less than others because of the electoral college situation. And their votes in congressional elections also because of redistricting. So I'm looking at that. And I'm also looking at something that's very dear to me is historically black colleges and universities. Um, pe people are concerned about them. Um, uh, uh, some of them have had some financial difficulties and have to shutter their doors. 
But what I'm also seeing is a phenomenon that I call emerging black colleges and universities, formerly non-black universities, have you know, several of them, particularly on the community college level, have developed and have become new black colleges and universities. And they've, and, and, and they've embraced um, black students and they've, they've you know, and a black leadership structure. So those are two projects that I'm, I'm in the early stages of. Excellent, excellent. And Professor Cohen? Well, I'm going to share something with you that might sound a little bizarre. My friend and colleague Nick Van Heer and I have written a tiny book. It's a kind of intervention. It's called Refugia. And it's an imaginative utopian construction of a transnational entity that's not a state, not a political organization, not a movement, but somehow an imagined space which will provide a home for displaced people everywhere. So that's our project. It's kind of crazy and utopian and futuristic, but I suppose I felt we needed to be in that space where we need to imagine something different from the grim reality that we have, that horrible form of populist nationalism we see in Brazil, in the United States, in Britain, in Hungary, in the Philippines, which I think is a dead end. That is really what humanity does not want to do, is get into closed little circles and shut off people. And so what Nick Van Heer and I have done is try to imagine a different space for displaced people everywhere. Well, you know, I, that would have a lot of resonance in a place like Trinidad, as you would be aware. You remember Lloyd Best when you were here? I do. Mm. In, in his um, model of the nine tribes of Trinidad and Tobago, um, which itself was mind expanding. One of the tribes was the Nowarians, the people who couldn't fit in anywhere. <laughs> and there are many okay. of us, many of a... us in Trinidad. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I want to thank you both so much. It, it's really okay. been great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Right. And well, that's it for this week's episode of Global Cultures on a Story Club Network. Thank you for watching. Take care. And I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.